Well, hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you're watching NP Practice Made Simple, the weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So one of my absolute favorite things to do is to talk about clinical topics with other clinicians. So talking shop is like my favorite, talking shop, quote unquote, is my like favorite pastime. Uh, basically ever. So in this week's video, I'm actually, uh, it's a recorded interview that I did with Ashley, the NP. You may have seen her already on Instagram. She is a pediatric nurse practitioner. And what I did was I reached out to the people on my email list um, and asked them what questions they'd like to ask a pediatric provider. And it was a really great conversation, very juicy, lots of difficult conversation type of topics, tons of pearls of practice. I really, really hope that you enjoy it. And if you haven't grabbed your copy of the ultimate resource guide for the new NP already, head over to realworldnp.com slash guide. You'll get all these videos sent straight to your inbox every week with notes from me, patient stories, and bonus content that I really just don't share anywhere else, including the opportunity to submit questions for upcoming videos. So without further ado, though, I would love to share this interview with you. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much, Ashley, for being here. Um, I would love to have you start by just sharing whatever you feel like sharing um, a little about yourself, what kind of practice you're in, the stuff you're up to, that kind of stuff. All right. So um, I'm Ashley. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner, uh, primary care based in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I've been a nurse practitioner for uh, just shy of three years. I've been working in the practice that I'm in for about a year and a half. Um, it's a small, tiny primary care practice. Um, tiny and that's only two providers, but very busy. We've got a lot of patients. Um, so it keeps me busy. I really like it. Um, my background in nursing is in the pediatric ICU, so it's a little different, um, but uh, similar in the sense of being busy and kind of always having to be on your toes. Um, aside from that, I teach nursing students as a clinical instructor. Um, I own a, red, a resume business, a resume and kind of nursing career service business, a renegade resume. Um, and couple of other projects, but yeah, that's pretty much me. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah. So, so these uh, questions, we can just jump right in. So the first question that I got was about, uh, was from somebody uh, saying, I just got accepted to primary care PNP today. I'm so stoked, but also very nervous. So hype me up. Give me some advice as I embarked on this new journey, and thank you so much. What what advice What advice do you have? As like um, advice, uh, advice for a new um, PNP. I'm again, I'm assuming that uh, accepted to the a program. Yeah, like a um, yeah. So yeah, I think just really one um, be teachable. I think going back to school. Um, after being an RN or, you know, working as an RN, you can sometimes have an idea of what you think things are or how things look or something that you've seen. You feel like that's the only way it presents. And, um, you know, sometimes you become a little unteachable because you're kind of stuck on what you've seen. Um, so just making sure that you are always keeping your mind open in terms of like new ways of looking at things in medicine. Um, that's number one. Um, two, on the kind of the flip side of that is also respecting what you do know. You know, there are things that your experience and, um, you know, past educational endeavors, I guess, um, have taught you. And you're only going to enhance that in a pediatric NP program. So um, anyone I, I assume that's going for pediatric NP um, usually has some type of history in pediatrics um, to go for such a specialized NP route. So um, you kind of know your stuff already. You know what you're dealing with and you kind of just are looking at it a little different way now. And um, you're going to use a lot of the skills that you learned and, um, you know, fine-tuned as a nurse in your NP program. 
Absolutely. And I love, I love what you, I love what you said about being teachable. Cause like, mm-hmm. I think that like so many nurse practitioners, like, I don't know. I think we're so in, generally speaking, we're intuitive people and it's like, yeah, yeah. It's like hard not to like follow that path of like the things that, you know, especially if you have a lot of nursing experience, yeah, um, such a different paradigm and it's, it requires so much like humility yeah. and training. And then also on the real world practice of humility for sure it definitely um, does it's it's a whole, a whole different ball game so yeah and what um, did you choose to do um so you did the pick you you said before as a nurse um, mm-hmm. did you always know that you were going to do pediatric NP or always do pediatrics or did you kind of just like find yourself there no yeah it was always pediatrics for me mm-hmm. I've that was never <laughs> Uh, there was a brief stint I thought maybe I'd like labor and delivery but mm. I noticed once the baby was born that's kind of on, the only person I cared about after so mm-hmm. I said you know what I think pediatrics is for me so totally. yeah I I can't relate to the oh trying to decide on a specialty or something that's just not something I ever had to deal with I've kind of always known from before nursing school it was going to be kids, so. Yeah, and I can, like, feel <laughs> how much you love the kids that you take care of, like, in your Instagram stories. It's just, like, yeah. you can, like, I can feel that you're, like, pediatrics forever. <laughs> yeah, I, there was never, like, there were a couple of moments, like, in job searching times where I was hardly finding pediatric NP jobs, but there were a lot of family NP jobs available, and I was just, like, oh, my gosh, like, should I have just done family or whatever? And then I remembered like, no, you, you literally cannot stand working with adults. Like you hate it. So like, why would you even do that? Knowing that you absolutely would never be happy taking care of adults. Like it would always be some type of compromise Mm -hmm. for me. So, um, yeah, it was just, it's always been peds for me. And I think, um, I think it's like, I don't think it always has to be someone who knows they like want to be in peds, but I think it's someone who definitely needs to like understand that like peds is a completely different world. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not, it's not easier by any stretch of the imagination. I I always feel like pediatrics always sounds like it's an easier thing or like, Mm -hmm. it's like kind of not as serious (laughs) and I'm like, I mean, they're cute. Like, yeah. They're very cute. Yeah, they're <laughs> cute. And we make things fun and we dress yeah. up and, you know, we, we do make things fun. But I've definitely, you know, done compressions and had an emergent intubation in a Christmas onesie before. So yeah. we're still we're still working. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's so, so true. Yeah. And I think that that sometimes is like overlooked. I think it's I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just because it is fun and because it's yeah. really fun. But I was, I, I, so I've worked one on one with some mentees and we've had conversations about pediatrics. And I'm like trying to distill a lot of information. And I, I feel like we were just talking about even respiratory illnesses in little, little babies. And I was yeah. like, oh, wow, this is like, I'm, I'm talking for a really long time. There's like a lot to mm-hmm. know. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, not that it's, yeah, it's just like, it's, it's like, yeah, it's just a different world. It's simple and it complicated is. at the same time in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. It's like you have to master. I have to know how to treat adult things too, because by the time my patients hit 12, they're basically yeah. adult size oh, and, yeah. you know, like <laughs> um, adult issues. And like I had I to take ACLS because I was like, I need to know how to like deal with adult things not just pediatric things wow. <laughs> you know in emergencies and stuff when I have like my 18 19 year old patients that are in or like you know so it's like I I have to know you know when their first teeth are supposed to come in and like you know what to how to handle a pregnancy like all of those things fall under my scope Oh, so true. yeah it's, and they're not um, for adults it's like completely different medicine there's different exactly totally different yeah the, yeah dosing medic medications you can give when you can start giving them like mm-hmm. it's treatment plans completely change so totally. it's, okay. yeah it's special so I think a lot of people who get into it should really know mm-hmm. how special it is <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Well, um, we have a couple, we have a couple of questions from the audience, from the people. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the next question, we, uh, how this, there are so many juicy questions in here. I should say mm -hmm. a lot of these are like very conversation and clinical judgment type of questions. And yeah. so we can share our own perspectives, of course, and the evidence, Absolutely. All the evidence, but there's so much. Absolutely. Yeah. So this question is a little tricky one. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a ton of experience with this. So I would love mm -hmm. to, I mean, everything you have to share uh, about right. it. How do you, how do you approach parents that are choosing not to vaccinate? What is your personal? Yeah. So, um, it's a very touchy topic. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it is, it is very touchy. So first things first, um, I am, again, this is my personal view based on the evidence that I believe to be fact based on what I was taught in terms of validating evidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you that's know, this is what I think. Yeah. That's my disclaimer. Yeah. That's all we do have in medicine. So we have to just go based on the way that we've been doing things and what we've decided is the way to do things so um I'm definitely 100% pro vaccination I um I I'm just pro vaccination I see no <laughs> no downside to vaccinating mm -hmm. children I only see upsides mm -hmm. um you know, in in ninety nine point nine percent of cases, except there are those few that, for whatever reason, they cannot have vaccinations for what you know yeah. their own medical reasons. But if you are well and able, I feel like you should. So, um, something that's huge for me when job searching, I I had I only looked at practices that mandated the CDC recommended vaccines mm -hmm. and on their schedule. Oh God, um, that advice for, for new so, nurses. Yeah. yeah. So for me, I think if that's something that you feel strongly about, you should definitely be putting that on your list of things to be looking for in addition to, you know, vacation time and are you paying for all of my like credentialing? Mm -hmm. Because um, it's huge and it can really impact the way that you do your work. When I was in school, um, I had the opportunity to spend a really long time in this one practice that um, does not mandate vaccines. And there are few and far between in Baltimore, uh, mainly because of Baltimore, is, um, the population here is highly dependent on um, Medicaid mm -hmm. for their health insurance, like state-funded health insurance. And the state-funded health insurance is mandate that the kids who use them get vaccinated mm -hmm. according to the CDC vaccine schedule. Yeah. So that's one of the stipulations to using, um, to getting Medicaid mm -hmm. in the state of Maryland. So mm -hmm. a lot of the practices here take Medicaid. And with that, they're kind of just like, you know what, everyone has to then, regardless of what insurance you have. So there are a few practices, though, that don't, a few, you know, maybe a handful that will be like, okay, you don't have to. So, you know, word gets out and they kind of all flock to these places. So mm -hmm. I was in one of them and it was just a very bizarre world for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was always taught in school, like if someone is refusing vaccinations, you're always supposed to kind of have a conversation with them, you know, educate them. Um, to be like, you know, first ask them why, you know, try to see if you can debunk any myths that they believe about vaccines, educate them about vaccines, whatever the case is, not to be pushy, but just to make sure they know everything that they should know and that the information that they're basing their decision on is actually fact. Yeah. So um, that's what I did. I went into a patient's room. Um, it was like a baby's like four month visit and, you know, they would have been due for vaccines. So I'm going through my little checklist. I'm a student. So I'm just like, you know, I'm just making sure I'm doing everything so I can go back to my instructor and make her super proud that I thought of everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, I went and it was like, okay, so she'd be due for this, this, this vaccine. Like I'm looking at my little printed out vaccine schedule, everything. And she's like, oh yeah, no, we're not doing vaccines. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I was like, well, may I ask why? Um, like what, what's your reason? And, she, um, she was just like, oh, we just don't believe in them. Like we're, um, you know, holistic. We don't do any kind of like medication or vaccines. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, well, I was like, do you know that like the the um, illnesses that they protect against are like, you know, can be really life threatening and, you know, whatever. So I'm just trying to like educate her a little bit. Mm-hmm. Nothing, you know, nothing to be like, you're a bad mom or, you know, anything <laughs> like that. Just like making sure she's aware of everything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, she's like, yeah, no, I know. We're just like really not into it. And I was like, oh, OK, well, you know, just wanted to make sure I let you know mm-hmm. everything. But of course, it's always your decision. Mm -hmm. um and I walk out of the room and then next thing you know that my instructor comes back and she's like oh yeah you know that mom was like really upset um and said that you were like pressuring her to vaccinate her kids and we don't really you know do that here if they Mm -hmm. say they don't want to vaccinate we just make sure they sign the you know form indicating that they're refusing them Mm -hmm. and we kind of just don't address it anymore and I was like, oh, um, you know, that's that's just not what I was taught. But mm-hmm. now that I know your culture here, I'll be sure not to say anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know in advance that she was refusing vaccines, you know, so I was just under the assumption that she was getting vaccines. So, right. you know, I, there was no harm done, I thought, on my part, but I had offended. And that was what made me realize that I couldn't work in a practice where, I would be ridiculed for trying to educate my patients and their families about like anything. So um, the practice where I work in now, um, it is one where, you know, educating is promoted, it's pushed, it's like you want to. And if you are deciding not to vaccinate your child, um, you know, with the state mandated vaccines, then we're just going to ask you to find another practice. Mm, so yeah I as far as approaching it to answer the actual question (laughs) um I I just go in with the facts I say look this is what is I always go in I always go in with the vaccine information sheet the little Mm two-pager that Mm -hmm. has all the info about it I say this is what you're getting these are you know the diseases it protects against these are the symptoms or this is what happens if someone were to come down with these diseases. This is what has happened with outbreaks in the past. We're finding that the more people decide not to vaccinate, the more likely that we um, will have an outbreak. And if there is one, your child won't be protected. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I, even right now, I've even been (laughs) kind of using COVID to my advantage to be like, you know, even with everything else that's going on, it's good to know that there's at least a few things that your child is not liable to catch. So, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, even if you're looking at it just that way, um, I can usually get parents to be on board. Um, but if they, if they aren't, um, it's kind of like a, sorry, you can't, you can't come here anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I so, think yeah. I've seen that a lot where there's, there's at least some kind of policy in place. Like mm-hmm. I mean, hopefully, hopefully your, your office has developed that. And if they haven't then that's Yeah. Great on a systemic level oh absolutely yeah we have one they're posted in all the exam rooms Mm -hmm. um you know they're told when they make the first appointment but a lot of them still feel like they can try to skate through and we won't Mm -hmm. notice (laughs) we're just like oh no 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 no! I know where every one of my patients are on the vaccine schedule Mm -hmm. and um yeah that's just one thing I cannot tolerate we do have some immunocompromised patients that come through Mm -hmm. um we have some like we have a ton of sickle cell patients who are Mm -hmm. just in that diagnosis immunocompromised and I can't risk you know us allowing people mixing and mingling even now with COVID but before then mixing and mingling in a waiting room with people who could be carrying, you know, vaccine preventable illnesses. It just mm. doesn't make sense to me. And I respect everyone's wishes. I do I a hundred percent do, but um I can't choose I can't choose to work in an environment where that's okay. Yeah, totally. So I think that like yeah. the I have a kind of a similar experience. Um we don't have the requirements. Um I work mm-hmm. in a qualified health center with has a lot of Medicaid. Um, and, mm-hmm. well. and um, I think for the most part, um, our schools are pretty intense about them, about getting them. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my clients are from recently came to the country. So I think that there isn't, it, it tends to, it, I, what I, when I see people coming with 
the objections to the immunizations, it tends to come with like a kind of a cultural paradigm of like, yeah, we don't, we don't do vaccines, you know, like that, like what you were talking about with the holistic. Right. I don't see it as much in terms of the, the clients and the patients that I'm seeing don't necessarily have that same kind of cultural belief about vaccinations. So I don't have mm-hmm. that often, but it's come up a handful of times. And for me, I know that it's similar to me as like, things like diabetes or any kind of chronic care. It's really like developing that rapport and like mm-hmm. asking permission to have a conversation and if they're open to it and if they're not, you know, and like you've done your due diligence of like, may I, you know, yeah. ask you about this, may I tell you about this? And they're like, mm-hmm. yeah, no, or like you tell them about this. You, you educate them, right? And at the bottom, at the end of the day, you've done your complete job and then you did, they just have to sign paperwork, you know, it's, but it's really- right. It's really because it is it's behavior change. It's behavior change and belief change. And that is unless it's because they're coming in without knowing something, and it's really tough to change. Um, it is. It a hundred percent is. Their mind is usually so made up before you even get started yeah. that yeah. Yeah. But I still try either way. Yeah. But oh absolutely, absolutely. There's some sure. people nice. you can just kind of sense their body language like you're you're talking just to talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is and fine. Yeah, and I think that I've seen like when when it comes to like beliefs and and behavior change, like I've definitely seen like some people like I had a I had nurse practitioner that I worked with who was there for ten years, and after ten years, somebody had been declining to do some sort of screening test. I can't remember what it was, and then just like after ten years, decided right because <laughs> like who knows? right like you're there that's, yeah yeah and you're yeah. Like, before and maybe maybe they will change their mind you know but yeah we just yeah. do the best we can with the vaccine. Um, I have another, yeah. I have another juicy question. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite population to work with, or like age group to work with, like babies or adolescents or school age kids? Like, do you have a personal favorite? Um, I do. Uh, my absolute favorite age is four. Oh, that's yeah. Age. I that's love cute. four. They are really cute at four. Um. I love talking to them. I like talking to kids. That's like one of my favorite things to do, um, which is why I guess like working pediatrics is so good because it's like, they are just so honest and they will just chat your ear off. And at four, they are like, their vocabulary like explodes and they are so excited about all the words they know that they want to share them with you. Mm-hmm. And I just let them go. And it is like, I <laughs> just ask them about their day and they, you know, ask them about school and their teacher and they just go on and on and on and I'm just like I just love it love a good (laughs) four-year-old that is my absolute favorite um speaking of like of talking with with kids do you have any strategies for building rapport with your adolescents and teens I super um (laughs) (laughs) it's always it's always um I it's a case by case it's still case by case because like um some of them are definitely very angsty and I'm just like oh my gosh I can't believe I used to behave like this because I remember it um and they're just like just like I don't want to enroll in their eyes and in their phones and I'm like oh my god like this is so something I'm not ready for um I can usually get them to um to open up just kind of like just talking to them, really, just, like, asking them about school or something, like, even if they're on their phone, I'm like, what are you doing in that phone? And they always start, like, giggling and will get <laughs> off or something. And I'm just like, are you on Instagram or, like, are you a TikToker? Like, what do you do? And I, they always start, like, laughing, like, why do you know about that? And I'm just like, oh, I'm hip. Like, I know what's up, you know? <laughs> um, and they, like, kind of just, like, be a little relatable. The teenage boys, I, I can't really seem to break that um there's a couple who are just like yeah I like to chat with you there are others mm-hmm. that are just like oh my god girl and I'm like okay <laughs> and it's like I'm younger and I get it like yeah girl but also provider you know mm-hmm. but they're like um I I can't like I've had a couple of my male patients switch over to my boss because he's male you know yeah. like yeah like I'm I'm not I, I don't want to force it I, it's it's awkward for everyone involved really mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah a lot of them I'm closer in age to them than their parents so it's like 
<laughs> even yeah, like, like my 18 year olds i'm like i'm definitely closer in age to you mm-hmm. we could be siblings really mm-hmm. <laughs> i know so i love that um approach of like that some 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 kind of connection you know yeah I think, um a, ner- a nurse practitioner that i know that works in the school setting she was uh, talking about how she kind of like starts as like the on the outside of the circle is like the um the school and then there's friends and then there's family and then there's the relationships because it can be hard to kind of get to the kind of deeper questions with with kids um yeah and one other thing which i i haven't been implementing but i definitely will will kind of more consciously do that and then i feel like the other thing that i find really helpful in our clinic is that one of the clinicians that i worked with nurse practitioners um developed this um, you know, like the craft, like the screening tools. Um, she she amended that. I don't know if they just came up with it based on the questions that they wanted to ask, but they basically just ask a lot of questions about like who they live with, who their friends are, um, all of the different like alcohol and, and sexual health questions. And and I'm shocked every time they fill it out. They fill it out completely and very honestly. So it's like kind of nice to have that in addition to those conversations because you can kind of get like how much like how much caffeine are you having and how's your diet? And like, it asks like, a lot of questions, you know? So right. that one in particular is working really well for me personally, because like I, it's drawing those questions out. is like a challenging sometimes. And exactly. Also, no, it really is. Yeah. And I also like make sure that like there's, and I don't know what the, the laws are in um, Baltimore, but like in Massachusetts where I live um, uh, there, the, there are laws to protect people um, I was talking about sexual health history such that they mm-hmm. can on their own and maybe that's national maybe I'm just oblivious to that but um, people can come in and, and talk about sexual health related topics on their own but additionally we have like a policy quote-unquote policy I don't actually know if it's a real policy but I say that it's a policy mm-hmm. where the parents have to step out of the room and like that can sort of be helpful my kids yeah yeah I do that too but yeah it's hard to yeah, get the, an answer out of them still, but at least yeah, you've given them the opportunity. And again, rapport over time. Like if you've said, like I say explicitly to them, like, listen, especially when you're talking about health, sexual health, there's a lot of things to be concerned about with adolescents, but that's definitely like a big one. And so yeah. like, for me, at least like over time, like I've explicitly said to them, listen, I have no judgment about any of this stuff. I'm here to help you. I can't tell your parents legally speaking, you know, um, mm-hmm. and I just hope that that makes a difference, you know? Yeah. Same. That's all I got. <laughs> same 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 Um, yeah and then when it comes so more juicy questions I have not (laughs) experienced this personal personally the situation but uh I would love to hear your uh experiences of how you handle when parents uh if Mm -hmm. they're divorced or separated disagree on the care of a patient this sounds so painful (laughs) yeah um and it happens a lot um yeah and sometimes it gets to the point where like we kind of just like if if it's going to be like this we need some type of official court documentation as to who yeah. has medical decision making because it 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 just becomes a game of like cat and mouse with us like being man in the middle like yeah. and it's it's too much like um you try to be like reasonable and see if you can get them on the same page but if they're like really at war Mm. um which sometimes they are you know and are really oblivious to how that affects their child um then we would we can make like a referral for them for someone to decide medical decision making um on between the two because it, it is absolutely absurd sometimes <laughs> dealing with them like calling and said oh well I wanted I I said I was making her appointment I was bringing her on this day and we're supposed to be doing this and this medication works better no this one works better and you're just like come on like this is you know we're talking about asthma at this point not like you guys being upset with each other yeah yeah and I think so. like, I think I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up about those court documentations because like the court documentation, because I think one of the, this is, this strikes me as like an, a situation that like, no, so many nurse, new nurse practitioners, I think mm-hmm. like struggle with those direct, like I'm in charge conversations. And like, that's yes. what you to be here is like, listen, like in a kind yes. way, right? Of course, kindly, but like, this is the situation, mom and dad, here's the situation. 
you know, and just laying mm-hmm. it all out very clearly. And like, if we cannot come to a resolution, like we are not like, this is how it will proceed. Because right. I definitely see like myself, like just looking backwards when I was brand new, like getting pulled into those conversations, like over and over and like, just not having that confidence to just like put my foot down and be like, direct and honest and just like uncomfortable a little bit you know not in an abrasive way but just right. in a direct way um but that's what that's really hard and it's nice to know that at the very least there is like what is what is the what is the kind of not like last resort but like that's kind of the last resort is like getting the court documentation involved right because like exactly solve it this way or we're going to solve it this way like here are your right. options please choose and i'm here to support you and take the best care of your child you know right um, but that is so, that is so hard. <laughs> it is. I will say most of the time that you do see it though, like where parents are, uh, the dad usually kind of concedes. <laughs> um, usually I'll say like, dad is like, okay, fine, whatever. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, there are a few cases where they're really both kind of fighting and you're just like, wow this is really so sad that this kid is like monkey in the middle Mm -hmm. oh my god totally um so more 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 kind of juicy questions yeah Um, so um I I I'm not entirely sure about this question but this is how I'm interpreting it so some providers do male hernia checks and Mm -hmm. some do not so I'm not I'm not sure of when to do it and so when do you suggest it what ages Mm-hmm. every wall child check or only sports physicals and I imagine what they're talking about is inguinal hernias but I think yeah really applies to testicular exams in general or like right a pelvic exam or like you know genital exams for kids and do you have right. a policy on that do you have um what so you not about? really a policy I kind of just like so I'm I'm happy this actually came up because my thing is I actually don't know what the recommendation is. Everything that I do, I try to do it based on the like recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Like Mm -hmm. I try to, and I'm not hundred percent sure like what the policy is. What I do, um, I always check um, both, you know, gender genitalia, Mm -hmm. Um, up until maybe about age like four. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I usually don't, unless there is a complaint or concern. Um, now I, I try, my biggest thing is I don't, I don't want to normalize anyone being there for no reason. Um, I think by the time they get to four or five is when we really start getting into, you know, making sure this is our safe space. No one touches us here. Only, you know, um, you know, the doctor's office, even like when I'm doing it, I always say like, you know, no one's supposed to be down here. Um, this is only okay at the doctor's office when I'm looking at something to make sure that you're healthy, yeah. Um, and your parents are here and things like that, but otherwise you make sure you tell your parents or someone, if someone else is down here, you know, I always confirm that before I go. Yeah. And like, I, I really don't want to normalize, um, genital exams for just mm-hmm. like no reason. There's literally no reason I need to check your genitals regularly mm-hmm. when you get to a certain point like I may do like I do a brief like pee just to check like tanner stage make sure yeah. you're growing like pubic hair and stuff the way but like as far as like an in-depth like in between your business forever I'm not there like that mm-hmm. my PCP doesn't do that like I <laughs> I don't I don't think that it's necessary um there are definitely times where young ladies will get like ingrown hairs or something. It's where they they have like genital warts and I have to like talk them off the ledge and I explain to them what's going on or like the boys who swear something's going on and also probably an ingrown hair. Mm-hmm. But like, um, aside from that, I try not to make it a habit of looking down there. Yeah. Um, yeah, for I, the, I totally oh, agree. Um, yeah. AP, like, I actually don't know AAP guidelines off the top of my head either as it relates mm-hmm. to these questions, but I think like the moral of the story and like the bottom line is that like, I totally agree with you. And I, I feel like let's not like traumatize kids, you know? Yeah. And, and like, yeah, like the, the, the point that I guess like the, 
what our kind of takeaway is, and we talk about this at our clinic, like there's kind of a discourse about it of like, when is it appropriate to do and for how long? And I think the challenge that I have is that we get kids all the time that are brand new patients, especially like new patients. Yeah. And so that's like a tricky question, but like what you're trying to look for is like undescended testes, which causes right. right? So if they've had it done before and consistently when they were little and like, there's no problems, then like, like, uh -huh. right. Um, and then just asking and, and having those conversations. And I love that you brought that up too, about like, I always have those conversations too, with little kids, especially by age three or four, that like, uh -huh. you're allowed to touch and like, this uh -huh. is what it means and here are the words to use. And like, also just kind of like some kids get really, some kids get really scared. So I brought this up with kids and sometimes they'll tell me that something has happened, whether uh -huh. it's the kid gets curious or, or who knows, like, that's usually the scenario that I, that, uh, that comes up. And then the parents will be like, you never told me that. And so I kind of like, I I've added into my counseling of like, you know, no one's allowed to touch and no one's allowed to ask. And so like, usually sometimes kids can freeze and they can feel scared and not know what to do. Uh -huh. Like, you know, just that picture, but like, here are the next steps. Like, here's what might happen. And like, here are the next things. Like, always tell. And it's really, it's a really hard conversation, right? It is. It happens with people that, that are close, right? And maybe that's an entirely different kind of conversation to go off on. But um, right. it's, it's important to at least talk about. And I remember as a new grad, like, all of these things I feel like are easy for you and I now. Like, when you're a new grad, that might be very uncomfortable. Yeah. To say those direct kind of confrontational things. But like, that is... That, who knows what that impact is going to have on that kid forever, you know, in terms of like, they're armed with that knowledge, you know, because bad things still happen in the world, you know, but yeah. And that's, that's really what it is. Like, um, I think as a new NP, the number one thing that you have to get used to is just like, believing in yourself as a provider like you're there you're there to do the job you have all of the the check marks and letters next to your name that prove that you can do your job mm -hmm. now it's up to you to believe it too you yeah. know I think we're oh. usually the last people to believe it and because of that we're like oh my god what do we say and it's like you know what to say you just mm -hmm. need to say it yeah. <laughs> you know um you know exactly what to do yeah and you're gonna probably feel stupid right because it's not gonna mm -hmm. be extremely polished Right. But like yeah. you, you have yeah. a faith in that, like, yeah, like that self-trust of like you, you have what it takes, you know what you know, like, and you exactly. Absolutely. And it's like, you may, you just like you said, you may fumble, but even like, I think you practicing and like sounding a little bit dumb in the beginning is what helps you strengthen. And you're just like, Oh my God, I know exactly what to say next time. Cause that was not it. You know, like that's what, that's what gets you out of the gate and like, yeah. you know, start, buffing out those rough edges so yeah, and I actually encourage a lot of my NP students I do a lot of precepting of students and I definitely mm -hmm. encourage them to like do things not like I'm not trying to make them uncomfortable and like put them on the spot but I always tell them like it's better to feel and like slash look like an idiot and I'm using air quotes here because you don't actually yeah. look like an idiot but it's better right. to do that when you're in training than you're on the job you know, and it's still going to happen on the job and it's better to just get it over with, you know, and like, yeah, get care. used to the feeling. Yeah. Most people don't notice and they don't care. And it's probably mm -hmm. they're worried about it, you know? Absolutely. So I want to check on time. Um, how are you feeling with time? Do you want to do a couple more questions? Do you want to look at the list and see what you think? Yeah, we could probably do, let's do maybe like two more and then you close out. Yeah, do you do you have a preference? There's one about allergy testing. Um, um oh allergy testing, that's a good one for right now. That comes yeah. up a lot. And um and then there's another one about um pros of practice for uh respiratory illnesses for like kids who can't take um uh can't take any medications. I don't know if you want to do that or if you want to do the pediatric ear exams or pediatric cases. Um, it, it, it's up to you. We can do, let's see, allergy, and let me see. Do you want to take them to the counter? I think childhood obesity. Um, oh, okay. Oh, childhood obesity, I can, um, oh, okay. We, actually, let's talk about that, because I get into, that comes up a ton. You like so, that? yeah, oh. let's do, yeah, allergy and obesity. Sure, sure. Okay. So, um... Okay, so next question, when do you refer for allergy testing and when do you just provide reassurance because nearly every parent comes in concern that their kid has allergies and is requesting a referral 
And so what does your conversation sound like if you don't refer? Love this one. Oh, goodness. So this one comes <laughs> up a ton. Um, and like it, uh, oh my gosh, it comes up so much. So this is my thing. Mm -hmm. um, so one, they're like, out like true allergies like and then their sensitivities that's one mm -hmm. and two there are allergies that we can do something about and there are allergies that we can't in terms of mm -hmm. avoidance Ooh, give it to so me. I I that's how I look at it I'm just like okay so a parent there are usually two scenarios one the most common scenario is my kid is sneezing, itchy, watery eyes, scratchy throat, X, Y, and Z, dry cough. Um, you know, I don't know what's going on. And I'm just like, okay, um, you know, let's do some like Claritin or Zyrtec, whatever, you know, something like that. Let's make sure we have a humidifier. Let's make sure we've changed our filter in the house. Um, let's make sure, you know, there are no little dust buddies and everything like that. Use some saline spray, rinse off our sinuses, stuff like that. You know, they'll come back and say, oh, you know, they still have allergy symptoms. Have you done any of the things I told you to do? No. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, you know, oh, well, we just want to go to the allergist. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, like, I'm kind of, <laughs> some of the parents like me for this, some of them don't, but I kind of look at them and I'm like, okay, and what exactly do you feel like the allergist is going to do? Mm hmm I asked them what they, what are they looking for from the allergist? Yeah. Um, and they're just like, well, cause you know, we just want to know what he's allergic to. And I'm like, okay, so he's allergic to something environmental. He's allergic to trees. What are you going to do about that? Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know? And they're just, yeah. I'm like, we can't cut down all the trees now, can we? Well, no. I'm like, okay. So you found out he's allergic to trees, then what? Yeah. Um, well, you know, we're going to give him the algae mess. I'm like, okay, so we're going to do the same things I told you to do mm -hmm. regardless. <laughs> you know so like I kind of I I reason things out with parents like I I'm not afraid to reason things out with them because a lot of times it's a lack of understanding right. a lot of times like parents will think that oh I'm going to a specialist and I walk into that office and I'm gonna walk out completely cured mm -hmm. I'm like mm -hmm. that is not what's gonna happen mm -hmm. you're gonna walk into an allergist and they're gonna say yeah he's allergic to like Bahama grass and ragweed and this and that and you're gonna be like oh okay and then he's going to hand you a prescription for Claritin. Like that, that's what's going to happen. And mm -hmm. they don't, they don't really get that. Same thing with the dermatologist and acne, same thing with like the pulmonologist and asthma. I'm like, everything that I'm telling you to do, mm -hmm. you're going to go to a specialist and you're going to be really upset to find out that it's the exact same regimen. And I just tell them like, Hey, you're taking off work to go to these specialists. Some of you are paying co to go to these specialists for them to tell you the exact same thing. I only recommend these specialists where, you know, my step one, step two, step three, you know, options have all failed. And I'm like, okay, you know what, at this point, I think we need a specialist to help us because I've kind of used all the tricks up my sleeves. That's when I refer to a specialist. Mm -hmm. I'm always a part, I'm like team, let's keep it primary care mm -hmm. as much mm -hmm. as we can. Yeah. Let's leave the specialist appointments open for people who actually need them. Yeah. Let's keep our parents at work and not having to take off work every five seconds to take their kids to the doctor when they don't need to. Like if I give them the tools they, you know, they need to take care of their own kids. <laughs> so yeah, I kind of go through that. Yeah. And I'm curious about, um, uh, if it comes up with food allergies for you, if do you have a lot mm -hmm. of those conversations, so yeah, one was living in Baltimore, you know, the seafood allergy comes up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so another thing is I'm, I'm all about like avoidance and like, you know, kind of preventative care, which I think is like the NP way. I always think that like mm -hmm. NPs are always about like, like we can treat things, but we'd much rather prevent it. And we'd much rather spend time preventing things. Whereas I think like MDs are always just trying to figure out ways to treat things. And I'm like, I think it's great. I think both are necessary, mm -hmm. but I kind of like our approach. Mm -hmm. And I think like what I do one with all of my infants at six months, I always recommend that they um, start peanut butter. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm, I recommend that they try it so that we can kind of lessen their chances of being, um, you know, having a peanut allergy. Yeah. Also, you know, helping parents kind of reintroducing things like lactose and stuff that babies need to have sensitivities to. We work on that. 
Um, if something does come up, like, you know, there's some odd reaction or something, I usually will refer to the allergist because I find the allergy blood testing isn't as sensitive as the skin mm. prick testing. Yeah. Um, so if it's really a food allergy that I'm thinking I'm going to need to give an EpiPen for, then I usually like to get a confirmation from an allergist. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but sometimes it'll be kind of like random things where like a kid um like bit his lip or something but it, it got all big and red and mom mm -hmm. is not like oh my god a crab leg and it's like no he kind of like bit his lip on a crab leg you know mm -hmm. things like that mm -hmm. um trying to kind of I'm like if your kid has had crabs you know like every every birthday his whole life now he's 17 all of a sudden he's breaking out the hives it's very unlikely Mm -hmm. um that it's crab yeah. but um you know it's kind of stuff like that I I try to do the avoidances of course there's some food allergy things you can't avoid and just it, it just is what it is but um some of them like peanut and stuff it's like the earlier you start to introduce and diversify their diet mm -hmm. the less likely that you'll bump into these allergies later on yeah Totally. And I love that you brought up the lab test because I think that question comes up a lot um, of like, should mm -hmm. I go the blood test? And I never do because they're just not, not as helpful as the skin. They're not testing. sensitive. Exactly. It'll tell you you're allergic to things that you ate this morning yeah. and you're just like, oh, wow. Like yeah. I have a level five allergic to eggs and I eat eggs yeah. every day. That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> and I think that one of the other things, and I'm not like, I'm not an allergy expert by any stretch, but I think the things that I've like seen is that typically the recommendations are like for it to be a true allergy, like you were talking about sensitivity versus true allergy. Yeah. For someone to have like an upset stomach is different than if they have like, like there's different, like actually types of like that. I think yeah. Like, Your IG, is it IG yeah. immediate yeah. or not? Yeah. Right. So do they have anaphylaxis? Do they have hives? Do they have a rash? Yeah. Like, is there um, some type of systemic or, response? Yeah. Yep. And like blood in the stool. Like, I think that like, and that's, that's like a probably an entirely different conversation, but I think that like that's, when it comes to allergies, I feel like some, some pearls of takeaway are like, you know, um, doing a full assessment of like what the symptoms are, what potential uh -huh. things there could be, not ordering the serum test, again, doing your own, you know, your own thing, if that's, if that's, that's your own thing, our, your and I, you know, philosophy yeah. to do that, but if that is your thing, you can do that, but then after that is like doing the most you can in primary care and then sending uh -huh. like testing and further treatment if we need to. Um, and that's, and that's really like my big pearl, I think yeah. with not even just that with anything like yeah. any of the, a lot of chronic illnesses and chronic things uh, can be managed in primary mm -hmm. care. Like they really can be. Um, sometimes like I'll even use, I'll use um, a specialist kind of to like drive my point home where I'm just like, yeah. I don't think they're getting it. I think maybe if they heard it from someone else, yeah. you know, maybe, you know, two messengers, same message might get there a little faster, but, um, but yeah, I, I'm completely down with the going to one provider and seeing a specialist when you need them. Mm -hmm. And if I feel like if everyone sticks with their regular schedule, like checkups with all their regular providers, you know, then to, GYN everyone like well we can lead the specialists to the people they really need to focus on which are the people who really are like seriously battling you know something within their specialty like mm -hmm. I there are people who have horrible allergies that have to get out you know weekly allergy injections and things like that like yeah. you don't need to go to an allergist to let them tell you that you're allergic to grass there's literally nothing you can do but there's nothing that can be done yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. so yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, the, our last question, we, uh, mm -hmm. is another really juicy one. We could probably talk all night about this, yeah. but, um, the, the question is any tips or advice for broaching the subject of overweight or obese kids? Have you ever referred to a pediatric weight management clinic? And this particular person was asking, saying that, um, her patient population is in the South Bronx and most are on public assistance and don't have great access to healthy food choices. Um, and any tips that you and I have about counseling these families? Yeah, yeah. So that is something that has, um, since I've been in my practice, so my practice is a pretty similar demographic to um, the one that this person who this question asker <laughs> uh, works with. So um, like, of course, low income, um, 
low access to like kind of healthy, affordable food um, is kind of my deal too. And Mm -hmm. COVID has not helped my situation at all. It has, it has been really, really insane. Um, seeing a lot of my patients now in the past, like couple months since COVID, how much weight they've gained, um, how sedentary they've been, um, athletes who were playing on, you know, teams like out of state are like literally not getting off the couch for like days. Um, it is, it has been, it has been quite a scene. Um, (laughs) I have referred so many people. So to answer the question, yes, I have absolutely referred to weight management clinic. Um, Mm -hmm. my thing with obesity, there's a couple things. So one, um, I think childhood, childhood obesity is, is, it's a huge, huge, huge issue. Like this Mm -hmm. is known, this is, this is fact. I don't think anyone's arguing that this is not true. Mm -hmm. Um, there, I can't tell you how many of my patients are like heavier than me, mm-hmm. um, like significantly. I have patients mm-hmm. who are over two times my weight. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to recently purchase a new scale because mm-hmm. our previous scale only went up to 350 pounds. And we have patients who are over 350 pounds and we could not accurately document their weight. So we had to get one that goes up to 650 pounds. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's, it's an issue. It's definitely an issue. Um, I think what we need to talk about is addressing it early. So when we have our little chunky two and three year olds that, that are also oh cute, mm-hmm. I think we need to start addressing their relationship with food mm-hmm. from, from then. Um, I think we let it kind of be swept under the rug for way too long Mm -hmm. um, in fear of hurting kids' feelings and, you know, Mm -hmm. seeming mean or treating them differently or something that we allow their health to deteriorate. Um, And it shouldn't be so. Um, Mm -hmm. I think we as adults also need to change our relationship with food and our like viewpoint of food um I think we need to stop looking at healthy food as a punishment Mm -hmm. I think it needs to be like more of a celebration it needs to be something that's celebrated being Mm -hmm. you know eating healthy being on a diet you know and I use air quotes with that um you know shouldn't be this like oh my gosh like why am I being forced to do this like Mm -hmm. I I I don't have kids yet, but I want my kids, and maybe this is me sensationalizing, like, parenthood, but I I want my kids to be, like, happy that they're eating healthy things. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm, going to be, I need to figure out a way to be that parent. Like, I want to be so excited about vegetables that my kids are going to be those weird kids. I'm like, oh, my God, yes, carrots. Like, that, that is what I want. Um, Because, you know, we, we always, like, celebrate around food. We always celebrate around treats. Um, You know, I want to normalize celebrating with an activity. I want to normalize celebrating with something that is not going out to eat. (laughs) And I think maybe COVID is helping us figure out other ways to do things like that other than being, you know, eating. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, making sure, like, being active is is a part of our lifestyle, too. We have a lot of screens. We have a lot of ways to, like, get away from being active. We don't have to walk anywhere anymore. We don't have to do anything anymore. Now, you know, it's hashtag unsafe to go outside. So it's like, we even have more excuse to be sedentary. And, um, you know, I've been telling my patients, I'm like, you need to hop on YouTube and get into some of these 30 minute workouts they have that you can do at home because you, you know, they're like, oh, it's unsafe outside. Um, You know, Baltimore's a lot of crime oh, it's unsafe, there's COVID. I'm like, okay, you can do it in your living room. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm like that YouTube that we can't seem to get you off of, it has workout videos on there too. And they'll be like, you know, I I tell them things they can do at home. One, I I always have a really long talk with my obese kids, like in their families. Mm -hmm. Usually it's not just them. Usually the parents are also obese. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's like, you know, the parents will be like, oh, yeah, he needs to lose weight. And I'm like, mom, you you are, like, no shy for 400 pounds. Like, you also need to lose weight, you know? And it's like, everyone needs to kind of change their viewpoint. Um, I definitely do refer to a weight management clinic that we have here. I really love it. Um, they have a GI doc. 
a psychiatrist, a dietitian, and a nutritionist on a team that manages like these obese kids. Mm. Um, and I think it's really important to have all of their vantage points as a part of the treatment plan. I think mm-hmm. psychiatry is so huge because a lot of these kids mm-hmm. have like underlying like depression and anxiety and things that kind of drive them to overeating mm-hmm. um, that if we address that, then we may even be able to address um, you know, the bigger issue at hand, which is their, you know, physical health. So, um, yeah, it's huge. It's Mm -hmm. my biggest advice I'd say, or something I take away is don't be afraid to address it. Like I address it with every obese patient that walks in my door. If I see them, I have to bring it up. I have to say something. I always make it a point. I'm not afraid. I always say it in front of the child. I always, I want everyone to hear what I'm saying. Um, no matter the age, I've had tears. I've had, you know, parents cry, kids cry, both cry, um, which I mean, I, and it's like, I always tell them, I'm like, this is coming from a place of love. It's not coming from a place of judgment or anything like that. I would be, I would be wrong if I knew I had ways I could help you and I didn't say something. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's always very well received, always, Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's like, sometimes they're just like, I'm so happy someone said it because like, I knew something was up, but I didn't know how to say it. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, you can be that person that can really like finally bring an issue out into the light so that it can be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. Like it just, again, like just being explicit, you know, and Uh very kind way and like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, when I talk about it with my kids and my family, it it is like such a family thing, right? Um, It's Uh because it's not like one of a couple, I guess a couple of things that have been helpful for me is like, one of the things is like, um, and just like, like you had said, like involving the family in the conversation and like asking like, what are your, like, do you, do you, have you noticed this or do you have any thoughts about this? And my languaging, I'm still working on making sure that it's the most like sensitive, but also direct. Right. But like at the same time, like, do you, um, like, what are your thoughts about this or what do you think is contributing? Because they can kind of give you the answer sometimes of like, you know what? I think it's because he, he eats really healthy food. It's just a lot of it or he has right. a, or something like that. Or like, he's not exercising as much because of COVID, like that kind of thing. And then I also talk about it in terms of the growth chart. Um, I imagine you do the same thing of like, if we're looking at the, I, we're always looking at the growth chart at all their physicals, all their checkups, right? Of like, you know, how tall are they and what is their weight? And when I right. show them, and maybe this is just, I am very visual, but like, it seems like it, it tends to go well where I'm just like, okay, so like, this is what we're thinking about in terms of this trajectory that we would expect for weight over time. And we want to make sure it doesn't go too far up and too far down. And so as you can see for this, you know, for this kid or whatever one we're talking to is like, you know, um, I'm noticing a trend of it going up and this just increases um, the risk of, you know, certain health conditions. Yeah. You know, and you can kind of start getting in there. And I, and I definitely, I'm really big on permission too, especially with touchy topics. Like, is it okay? If yeah. With you? Is it okay if we talk about Right. That, you know? um, and a lot of times they're like fine with that, but I, even just like practicing in their practitioner school, we did this exercise with somebody like talking about lab results and they, and they, and I was like the patient and they were like, can we talk to you about your labs? which is such like a silly kind of like quote unquote silly question of like, of course I want to know about my labs, you know, but like just that extra, extra level of like involvement and permission and connection with patients. Like I think makes a big difference too. Um, but I definitely right. also refer to a weight management clinic and we have, we had a program called fitness in the city where you, um, it was like a, I think associated with our grant funding and also the, maybe the Medicaid insurance where they can, um, you know, come and exercise and stuff like that. Um, do like fun types of exercise. Right, right. It's really tough. Yeah, it is tough. And I just think like, I one, I would I would hate to address something if I didn't feel like I, I had something to offer yeah. in terms of helping, you know, like mm-hmm. I, I address it because I want to help. It's like, I think addressing it just to talk is like mean, you know, yeah. it's like oh, if you yeah. don't have something to offer and like some pearls or some way to help, mm-hmm. if you're going to bring up, a, you know, bring something up, like it just sounds cruel. So I would say like, look, I'm coming with help. I'm coming from a space of love it's coming it's coming from caring I even sometimes like at majority of my um of my patient demographic is 
you know, also black. And I always say like, look, like these are things that affect us more, you know? And like, I'm here to make sure that I'm looking out for all of us and making sure that we are being as healthy as we can be. Like, we know that, you know, I'm like, I know for a fact that, you know, there's someone in your family that has high blood pressure or diabetes and they always say yes, you know? And I'm just like, same here. So it's like, we need to make sure that we're protecting the kids. Like it starts from a lot earlier than we think. Mm-hmm. And usually when I even bring it to them like that, they're just like, you're right. You know, like, let's, let's see what we can do. What do I got to do? What number do I got to call? I'm like, all right, let's do it. You know, like, let's work on it. Yeah. So yeah. I even like, I've even bargained with kids like, Hey, look, I'm going to get you like a personalized cell phone case. Like if we can Aww. drop 10 pounds in six months Aww. and they're like, Oh yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I want that case. I'm like, all right, so I'm going to order you the case, but you got to make sure you drop them pounds. They're like, all right. And then it becomes like a little, like, little challenge and they're like super motivated so I try you know like anything that I think will help motivate them and get them moving I'll do it but um it's all talk it all starts with talking if you don't talk about it then none of that is ever going to happen yeah and I love that like I think another alternative too is if you don't have that resource of like a weight loss pediatric weight loss Mm-hmm. is that like you can do your own care plans right like you can, yeah you can just make a plan with them of like here's my concern like what are some goals we can set and also like instilling mm-hmm. health and like I love having those like counseling specific visits so where it's like you're not necessarily doing a medical diagnosis and intervention I mean your counseling is the intervention but like right follow-up appointments of like having those visits having those conversations follow-up visits just like, like checking in yeah and like here's, how's it going yeah and like here's how we're tracking it. we're making progress I believe in you like I'm supporting you and also just like getting their buy-in you know and customizing that kind of follow-up plan um it's not easy right especially if we have a 50 right. but it is possible and I think that it's so important to bring all of our passion towards it you know yeah for sure absolutely well yeah, um, thank you so much for hanging out and talking with me uh, and Sharon, yeah, this is fun. Uh, where can they, where can the, um, people find you? I am really mainly on Instagram, Ashley BNP. That's me. Um, you can catch me there. I, my business is the Renegade Resume at the Renegade Resume, um, all one word. Mm-hmm. And yeah, custom resume stuff or resume templates or what kind of stuff? Yeah, we do. We have templates, resume templates, cover letter templates, mm-hmm. um, interview prep guides. I have an NP credentialing guide actually that will probably be really good for the listeners of this, um, <laughs> this podcast. Oh. It um, helps new graduate nurse practitioners navigate becoming like a licensed and certified nurse practitioner which is not an easy process um and I don't think it is discussed enough um it's a lot of kind of like asking people that you know graduated before you or preceptors like hey so what do what do I have to do how do I get this and like what order do I do it in and all of that um so I created a nice, it's a nine page guide that is like pretty inclusive for, of everything um, that you need to do. Of course, there'll be some things that'll be state specific, but even those things are identified as to like what you need to do to find out if you're, if you need to do this for your state and how to do it. And so um, that'll be a really good gem for the listeners here. Um Also, um, we do resume, cover letter, personal statement. Um, services so we'll do editing and creation of resumes um cover letter editing personal statement editing um mock interviews about a personal statement so hopefully they're listening (laughs) yeah yeah so yeah that's a that's something that's been coming up a lot lately a lot of people are thinking about going back to school we've been getting a ton of personal statement edit requests so um take advantage of that we've definitely been helping people really fine-tune their personal statements to say exactly what they want admissions officers to know about them so yeah it's we have a lot the renegade resume.com yeah. is the website <laughs> awesome well thank you so so much of course thank you for having me this is fun <laughs>